Hello again. Please forgive me for uh, having the pillow here. Uh, my back has been giving me some very serious issues lately. I imagine uh, that doesn't matter to you guys. I'm just, you know, giving you the reason. As usual, I will be putting a link up about this game in the uh, com comments for some place you could discuss things with spoilers attached. I will also ask that you do not give spoilers within the comments. And as usual, I'll be trying this format that seems to be working so far of me talking about just about everything I can without spoiling anything first, and then giving a defined, you know, hey, I'm about to stop, and then getting on with spoilers. I should probably turn this light off back here. There we go. All right. <sighs> you have to forgive me. So I try to figure out where I am. Okay. Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, right? Ah. <sighs> Now, with regard to the series as a whole, I know opinions are rather divisive, and I have a feeling I'm going to get some flack from my own opinion on the matter, uh, because I tend to think of things differently than most people do, and Lord knows I've had unpopular opinions in the past. For example, I have defended Dragon Age 2. Not a great game, but, you know, I did <laughs> defend it. I, in fact, I did a whole video about it. Um... But, in my personal opinion, if we're talking in terms of overall quality, the series kind of did this, and went up with 2, and then kind of dipped with Brotherhood, and then went up significantly with Revelations, okay? There, there's there's my opinion in a nutshell. I'm not talking about the Gaiden games. Um, I do want to mention something in brief. Uh, I have been talking at length with a friend of mine about 3, and f the general impression I get is that 3 is actually quite good gameplay-wise, that it is very enjoyable to play, and that the side games are genuinely fun, and the whole, you know, furniture, house-building, ship-sailing thing is actually rather enjoyable, and that the world is huge and there's lots to do. But that the story is rather severely lacking, and uh, for reasons I won't really get into per se, except to mention them here because they're immediately relevant to this game. You see, one of the things I feel that is a failing of Brotherhood is the same thing that my friend feels is a failing of Three, the story is not very well characterized. It is not very much character-focused. And both he and I tend to prefer stories that are very character-focused. Despite all of my, you know, political plots I keep putting over on Voyager and whatnot, ultimately all of that is background. All of that is setting. All of that is backdrop. The idea is to still have the episodes, to still have the story be about the people, right? Uh, I may not succeed all the time, but that is the intent. So... Let's move that off the stop button. Lord knows that sometimes hits by accident. I don't realize the video's actually stopped recording until like 20 minutes have passed. Um, that is, uh, just in a nutshell, one of the things I do find to be a failing about Brotherhood. But at the same time, everything I'm going to start off talking about is nothing but praise. First and foremost, multiplayer. I'm actually not going to talk about the multiplayer at length. I apologize. What I am going to say is very simple about the multiplayer. It's there for the first time, and it's good. Moving on. Um, this is the first game that really included uh, horses as a major mechanic. I know that's a weird place to spot to start. I, I just was kind of writing down as I was going here. Um, and that's for reasons uh, of, of landmass size. So, but I wanted to start up talking about horses first. It's uh, an interesting concept because, well, we've had some kind of vehicle sections before, having horse travel be a regular thing, and having certain stunts and certain abilities you can do on horses and whatnot has never actually been a, ma a feature of the games to this point. The reason why I am in favor of the horses is, A, what I like to call the Ocarina of Time effect, <laughs> for lack of a better term, and I'm not going to explain that. Any of you out there who know what I'm talking about, get it immediately. But B, and actually far more importantly, Brotherhood is rather large, all things considered. In fact, I would go so far as to call it big. Not huge, necessarily. You see, one of the things they did very differently, with, and this is the second point, or third point, I guess, is Brotherhood, it takes place within a single uh, instance, basically. Single uh, event zone, whatever you want to call it. As opposed to having multiple different zones and having loading screens between them, or like in one, or having multiple zones across quite a bit of an area and, you know, little travel things between them, like in two or in, uh, they do this in 3 as well, by the way. All of Brotherhood, it takes place in one big old place, and this is a very large city. It's Rome, after all, or Roma, if you prefer. And it's it's big, and in fact, one of the things it includes is a fairly large amount of countryside, which is also good. Um, obviously, riding a horse through the center of town is going to be problematic at best, but when you get out towards the country, when you get out towards the X... X... X uh, word... Um, 
Oh my god, I, I just completely lost a word in mid-sentence. When you get out to the outer edges of the, uh, of the general vicinity of the city, and you get out into the countryside, being able to ride around on a horse is an enjoyable experience, and it also helps flesh it out quite a bit. While there is a degree of fast travel still involved, because they added the tunnel systems, being able to just roam is nice. Being able to go off the rails is nice, and being able to go off the rails with relative speed is also nice. And it is also kind of nice because if you're going full tilt on horseback, nine times out of ten, you don't have to pay attention to being caught by the guards. You're just like, yep. <laughs> what are they going to do, you know? So, that was a good thing. Um, I mentioned the fast travel. One of the things I also really enjoy about uh, Brotherhood is the jumping puzzles. I mentioned these back in Assassin's Creed 2 as well as being rather enjoyable. I really enjoyed the sections in Brotherhood. The whole point is you're going through this area, getting the the pieces of the puzzle from uh, Brutus, and uh, learning about his story and whatnot, and how it relates in this setting to the Assassins and Templars and that whole thing. But the jumping puzzles themselves were immensely enjoyable. I have nothing but good things to say about them, really. I, I do. They, they were awesome. They were fun. I loved them. Um... One of the reasons I loved them so much is because it's basically the equivalent of... It's the Assassin's Creed equivalent of a boss fight. What a boss fight should be is kind of a test, or a, not a test, a uh, an exam of everything you've learned to date. You know, have you leveled your guys sufficiently? What strategies are you using? Uh, depending on what kind of customization ha you have available to you, you know, have you picked a good pa party? Have you picked a good setup? Have you good, good equipment? Have you learned how to use your abilities properly? You know, all that sort of thing should be tested it within the exam that is the the boss, right? Not the final boss, just any given boss, right? Now, of course, there's another purpose in a boss, and that is to service the story, but I, I, that, I'm talking from purely gameplay perspective. Assassin's Creed doesn't really have bosses in the combat sense of the word. It has bosses in the sense of these places. Everything you've learned about free running, everything you've learned about being able to climb and jump and aim and all that fun stuff is tested here. This is your exam. Because here, if you screw up, it's not just going to be, uh, you, you might lose, you might have to start all over again, you know, blah, 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 blah. The, the stakes are higher and it is more difficult. You, you see where I'm going with this? And I think it was a very innovative way to approach this. I, I, don't get, I can't give Brotherhood specifically credit for this because this really started in Assassin's Creed 2. But I do have to nevertheless give Brotherhood credit for doing it better overall, in my opinion, than 2 did. And really getting across this whole concept, really well done. And what the best part of all is, of course, these are optional. You don't have to do them if you don't want to, if you're not into that sort of thing. Although I, of course, would recommend it. Um, I, I really should have mentioned this first. This isn't... Well, okay. <laughs> there is no way to say this without sounding like I'm getting back into that whole PC console argument, which I'm not. But Brotherhood was the first game to actually properly be ported to the PC. That is in its favor, or rather in its developer's favor. Not because the PC is superior or whatever, blah, 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 blah. You know, just fling that out the window. It's not relevant. It is relevant because... <sighs> It's just kind of, if you're going to port a game, do it properly, is, is really what it boils down to. Assassin's Creed was not ported properly. Really, that's all it boils down to. Assassin's Creed 2 was not boiled properly, ported properly. Assassin's Creed Brotherhood and Revelations were both, both ported properly, and I ended up enjoying the games more because they were. Now, admittedly, part of that is also some revisions that went into it, which I'll get into in a second here. But I, I just had to give credit for that, because Brotherhood was the first of the Assassin's Creed game that didn't bother me to play if you understand what I mean. And I have talked to a few friends of mine. Excuse me, I'm just having issues tonight. I have talked to a few friends of mine, and this is apparently not a PC-exclusive concept. Uh, several friends of mine believe that Brotherhood was the first time at which they really enjoyed playing the game fully. You know, it wasn't irritating, it wasn't frustrating, there weren't problems with it, so... Um... Speaking of which, one of the things they did is redid the combat system uh, in, a, in subtle ways and in quiet ways. It's actually kind of hard to explain properly. But put simply, in Assassin's Creed 2, despite being the brawler on, the, on all that, you were kind of limited in the manner in which you could react to things. Um, it, it's actually really hard to describe, especially because I don't want to get into the code of the matter. But essentially... In Brotherhood, it got to the point where if you're in the middle of doing a killing combo on somebody, and someone else goes to attack you at, at just the right moment, and you respond in just the right way, you will interrupt your combo to go after them, and then you can use that to continue going off into this guy, and you know, blah blah blah. It was smoothed out a great deal, and it gave the player more options. I'm, I'm, I'm only just barely touching the surface here, but it gave the player a great deal more options with regards to combat, rather than just you know, what it had been before, which is either mash buttons or, you know, do the 
do the twitch routine with with the counterattacks and I liked that and it's really uh, one of my screenshots I saved on Steam was of uh just outside the gates of where the 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 the, the Vatican is and I had killed I, I don't know at least 40 guards they had actually started despawning because every time I'd swivel the camera away, it would be like, oh, there's too much stuff here, and it would remove a couple of bodies by the time I actually finished killing them all. And I did the whole thing while only losing, like, two bars of health. And that was fun. It was a lot of fun. While you could argue that it takes some of the danger out of it, some of the threat, one of the points I've always felt with Ezio is that he's not in danger. He's Ezio. As has been pointed out before, he is the warrior of, of the archetypes, and he is definitely the guy who is completely comfortable with taking on 30 guys without breaking a sweat, because he's Ezio, right? And I was with that. That's one of the things Brotherhood also goes out of its way to emphasize. Um, I also want to mention the... Uh, oh, shoot, I forgot how to pronounce this... Montegirioni sections? I could be saying that wrong. It's the sections where you're at the house, the villa, as Desmond. Um, I, I still don't feel this is a spoiler. Brotherhood is the beginning of the Desmond story arc. That's all I'm going to say with regards to that. I'll talk about that more later in the spoiler section. But I do put this in the good category. This is the first time Desmond, in my opinion, has actually mattered to the story. It was here in Brotherhood. And it just barely begins, you know, with with his little sections in, in the present day and doing several of the jumping puzzles and running around the, the castle in present day. And I rather enjoy that, in all honesty. Even though there wasn't a terribly large amount to do, the fact that you could leave the Animus at any time and just go around and talk to people really helped flesh those characters out and helped flesh Desmond himself out. And that's kind of my point. One of the, my complaints that I mentioned earlier was that Desmond felt vestigial, basically. And that's because he was. It isn't until Brotherhood that he actually becomes anything, any any sort of character, in my opinion, of course. But I'm I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, oh my goodness. This is going to be a shorter video, by the way, because most of the points I want to make about Brotherhood I will be making in my Revelations video, believe it or not. Hmm... Well, let's talk about one of the big problems, and one of the things I mentioned, that whole downside dip in uh, Brotherhood, despite all the good things I've been saying, and good things I still have to say, for that matter. Assassin's Creed 1 had its issues, most of which were related to um, boredom. You know, uh, repetition, really. Assassin's Creed 2 had its own issues, most of which were related to UE, and uh, I, I've heard some legitimate complaints about the speed and pacing of the story, because it covers a huge portion of Ezio's life. But... I'm still okay with that. I'll, I'll discuss why when I get to Revelations, because that's really where that all comes to a head. Brotherhood. <sighs> One of the biggest problems I've seen with Brotherhood, and I've seen many people make this complaint, uh, not, necess not necessarily in these words, but effectively in this manner, that Brotherhood is an expansion to Assassin's Creed II, but it wasn't actually billed as an expansion, and it wasn't actually uh, priced as an expansion, and both of these things are a problem. If this had literally been Assassin's Creed 2, colon, Brotherhood, I think this th that simple change would have done better, and if they were m more upfront about it, because, let's be honest, Brotherhood is, for all intents and purposes, an expansion. And I've said before, I'm in favor of an expansion. What is an expansion? An expansion is taking the existing game, the existing format, engine, models, etc., and adding more content. And a game like Assassin's Creed is basically custom-built for that. This is even more obvious because the last section of Assassin's Creed 2 occurs in Rome. Just a little bit of it, just this one little sliver of it. But Assassin's Creed Brotherhood literally takes place a couple of minutes after that. You know, again, that whole direct serial thing coming on. And is in the same place in Rome, and then the whole story takes place in Rome. It, it just, the whole thing made perfect sense. It isn't a direct sequ it isn't an actual sequel, like, say, Assassin's Creed 2 was, or indeed, Assassin's Creed 3 was. Revelations is also not a true uh, sequel. It's more like an expansion. I think they did Revelations better, personally, but I'll get to that later. So that's one of the big problems. The other big problem is, this is conjecture. And this, I'm still not getting into spoiler territory yet, but it feels like they weren't sure where to go with the story. I know several pe uh, key people quit right about the end uh, of the development cycle of Assassin's Creed 2 that may have contributed to this. I don't know. Again, conjecture. But it really does feel from me, from, from a viewer's perspective, from a gameplay perspective, that they just kind of lost their way, and Brotherhood was them pushing out what they, you know, they had a few notes left, okay? They had a few tidbits left, and they're like, okay, let's make a game out of this, and then let's kind of start over again, basically. And it's worth noting that 
I, I feel like they succeeded in that start over part, but Brotherhood itself is that gap. It really is just the gap. It's this one little spot here in between two and Revelations, and it's like, eh. and it suffers for it. It's a shame because there are, again, the combat is awesome, and they, they've fleshed out the Yui, and they added another mechanic, which I will talk about pretty much towards the end of this part, of the no spoiler part. But overall, you know, it feels lacking. Because not only does it feel like an expansion, it feels like kind of a half-assed expansion, if you know what I mean. It feels like they were only going part way with this one. Let's go ahead and talk about that last mechanic. I only have so much to talk about, like I said. One of the things I wanted to talk about initially uh, has since been proven wrong. I did more thinking about it and shared some thoughts with a friend of mine, and we both agreed that I was actually wrong in my conclusion um, because of a little bit of inf additional information I hadn't really taken into consideration. I still find it interesting because it, the same point can make a the same ev evidence can make a different point than I originally mentioned. Altair. Um, well, okay, I, I don't want to get too much into spoilers here, because I want this still to be in the non-spoiler section, so let, let me just let me just scooch that back a bit and mention that this game's mechanics about the uh, city renovation thing, which is basically what it's called, had its own lore repercussions. I'll get to those later in the spoiler section. Let's talk about the mechanic itself first. First of all, while I did enjoy the city renovations mechanic, I actually have a decent amount to say here. Let, let's just start with with uh, the basic premise that you kind of have to do it, okay? That's really what it comes down to. You don't have to have to. You can get by without it, but you will have not only a harder time, but it will be far more irritating, and you will probably enjoy the game a lot less if you do not do the city renovations mechanic. I mention that because that basically makes it a lot less optional, which it should be, and a lot more mandatory, which it shouldn't. Now, that being said, I will have to give them props that it is technically optional. You know, for example, if you just go straight for the Brutus armor and never use anything but your Assassin's Blade, which you can do, and I know people who have done that, you don't need to do the renovation mechanic. If you want to upgrade your pouches, if you want to upgrade your knives, if you want to have a source of, of re repairs, if you want to have a source of uh, ammunition, if you want to keep buying additional medicine, you're probably going to have to at least do some of the renovations. Not all of it. So that's still at least kind of a bonus. But my main problem with it is it's something that was added as a feature that should have been more optional, like, uh, again, I hate to mention this, but the, the the tower defense mechanism over in Revelations, which, let's face it, was incredibly optional. Y you had to basically intentionally make yourself do it, if you know what I mean. You had to intentionally not care and play the game in a certain manner to make it even possible to do it all. In fact, on my playthrough of the Revelations, I had to specifically allow myself to get attacked by the Templars on several occasions, specifically so I could get the uh, the, the bonus for having succeeded three times in a row for the little uh, challenges thing. That's an optional mechanic that can be played if you want to. Renovations, not quite as much. It's a, It's kind of a halfway thing. I mention that very importantly because I personally do enjoy that kind of thing. I prefer customization. I've talked about this before. The Suikoden thing, or the Breath of Fire 2 thing, if you prefer, where I am given an area and I can put money into it and invest in it and customize it. Now that customize part is important. In this case, there is zero customization. I can upgrade, I can buy stuff and they can give me more money back, and that gives me uh, more access to various things, all of which money are basically like money-based, but also gives me our access to upgrades and shit like that, you know. I can actually do that kind of thing. Not really a big deal, but that's kind of my problem, is that it isn't really a big deal. Ultimately, it's just kind of an, a little mini-game that you kind of have to do, and isn't as enjoyable as it should have been. In fact, I found myself getting rather bored by the end of it, especially since Roma is so huge, as I mentioned earlier, and so running around buying everything just kind of became a chore after a while. Now, um, there's actually one other thing I want to talk about before I move on from the City Renovations comment thing. Uh, I actually mentioned that... Er, meant, meant, well, okay, you know what, I, I screw that. Let's go ahead and chop the line here. <laughs> I'm going to start t talking freely about spoilers without regard, and this is my usual warning. Uh, I'm going to be recovering some of the things I've already mentioned, uh, just in more detail. But, you know, spoiler warning, three, two, one. Now, one of the things that I really like about this whole thing is it really speaks to the change in the history of the Assassin's Creed series, okay? 
Altair helped to establish the Assassin's Creed Order, and basically built it for all intents and purposes. Yes, it existed before him, but it existed in such a limited fashion. After him, there was an Assassin's Creed Order for all intents and purposes globally, you know, as, glo as, things, as global as things were at the time. Then from his time to Ezio's, the Assassin Order wasn't really doing all that hot and was generally suffering under the yoke of the Templars for all intents and purposes. Ezio then comes along and basically renovates the entire thing. Now the point I wanted to make is that what Ezio decided to do, in a nutshell, was to decide to play the game by the Templar's rules. In Assassin's Creed II, we learned that the Templars and Templar agents basically invented the application of capitalism in the manner that it is used, uh, optional slavery in exchange for paper, I believe was the quote, to help affect a long-term type of control over the world, because using the aristocracy and using, you know, nobility and, and military and armies and like that just stopped working after a while, and so they needed a new system. Within Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, we see Ezio decide to use their own tools against them. Now, the original point I was going to make was this was what led to the overall downfall of the Assassins until I remembered uh, several bits and pieces from the comics and from the other things, and so I was like, okay, never mind. But it does still illustrate the actual main point that I am still making this for here, okay? Now, let me, if, I, if I'm not making too much sense, let me back up a little bit. Prior to this point, the Assassins worked outside of the system, okay? The system of, that the Templars had established, basically, which could be summarized by a single word, money. That system had been in place for some time, and the Templars had been using it to control things, and will continue to do so for up until the modern age, really. That system, and, and it's funny because whenever I look at that and I try to describe it, I fail. It is, it's an incredibly complicated and yet ultimately simple system, so forgive me for not going into detail on it. They describe it well enough in the games as well. Um, with that system established, the assassins had always been moving outside of that, killing without regard to political or economic concerns, basically, you know. Um, one of the things I've talked about before in several of my game uh, things and several of my D&D bits and several of my uh, Voyager videos is the idea that you can't just walk up and kill this guy. There's ramifications, there's complications, there's problems that that causes, you know? That's not necessarily the out. Well, th what the assassins had been doing up till Ezio's time is basically taking that, that you can't do that and flinging it out the window and just doing it anyways, and either getting away with it or dying in the process. And as is obvious based on how bad the assassins were doing, relatively speaking, I mean, obviously they were still out and about, but, you know, they hadn't actually started winning, it wasn't working. Ezio turned all that around by deciding to play the system itself. He st and, and I love this so much because it is a game mechanic in addition to being a story and a lore, lore thing. It's a, it, 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 it services the story and the gameplay at the same time. The whole city renovation thing exists to emphasize that that is actually what Ezio was doing. It wasn't just to a source of income for the player. It was to show that Ezio had decided to start working that game, the investment, the uh, provincial, as I like to call it, side of things, you know, actually working through money, actually taking territory, actually uh, taking ownership of several of the cities, actually in, um, funding uh, organizations and, and, and pushing uh, subtly, in, in, in the same way that the Templars were, pushing scientists, pushing artists, you know, that kind of thing, trying to work with the system, through the system, instead of around or regardless of it. Oh, pardon me. And this is when the Assassin's Order basically rose to a point of prominence and remained in basically a stalemate for all intents and purposes with the Templars for for quite a long time, all things considered. And, uh, yeah, enough said on that one. I, it's, it's a it's a wonderful thing. Uh, granted, while the renovation thing can get a little boring, I'll freely admit that. Even me, who enjoyed it to an extent, found it a little bit dull by the end. But I liked its application as a storytelling tool in this case. And I, I just had to mention that here. Uh, I mentioned the Desmond arc. One of the big things about the Desmond arc that really starts here is that we finally start to see him and Lucy actually talk a little bit more about themselves and indeed uh, the other two, and yes, I can't remember their names, Sean, I want to say, is the name of the British guy, and I can't remember, uh, Rebecca, that, that's her name, Rebecca is the name of the girl. We actually start to hear more about their characters, we have to start to hear more about Desmond as a character. We only get tiny bits and pieces of his past, but up until this point, if you remember, all of his past has been, I worked as a bartender and I don't, I'm not an assassin anymore, and that's basically it. That starts to actually get fleshed out for the first time, which is nice, and a, and a good move in my opinion. Furthermore, 
I, I mention this because this is a, again, this is a bridge story. It isn't until Revelations that we actually start to have a Desmond story. And I'll talk about that more when we get to Revelations, obviously. But at the very least, I have to give Brotherhood some credit for being that bridge, for basically laying down the stones and saying, here, Desmond is actually someone now, and has some kind of relevance now. You can talk about him now. Um, one of the really horrible things about this, the Assassin's Creed so story, is how Ezio's life was completely and utterly destroyed by the, this war between the Templar and the Assassins. And it's one of the things he laments more than once, in more than one thing, you know. Um, towards the end of Revelations, one of the things he mentions is, you know, I, I hope all this pain and suffering and death has been worth it for whatever this message is, that kind of a thing. And so, I just had to mention that here, because this... Yeah, this game emphasizes that in a way that hadn't actually occurred to me before, if that makes any sense. Uh, to give you a little bit of a background, I picked up the Assassin's Creed series when Brotherhood came out. In other words, I played 1, 2, and Brotherhood pretty much back-to-back, -back, one right after the other. And then there was a big, big old pause before Revelations came out, and then 3 came out. But going from 1 to 2 to 3, there was this impression I had that it's you... And, and and the game goes out well of its way to get this, that Ezio had won, basically. He had defeated Bor uh, Borgio, or Rodrigo Borgio, uh, however heck you say his name, and you had discovered the big message for Desmond, and had avenged his father and done all this stuff, and, and rose, risen the assassins. Well, he hadn't actually done any assassins yet, but that's kind of my point. He hadn't risen the assassin order up. He hadn't done all this provincial thing I just talked about. He was ready to retire. He went home. He decided to relax and just live his life, because that's what he wanted. I mention that because that is very relevant to the next thing I'm going to be talking about, but first I need a drink, because, oh my god, my throat. Oh god. Curious side effect of doing this show. So my throat hurts a lot. <laughs> or at least when I do several videos in a row, which I usually do. This is actually my third video tonight. <sighs> Ezio was fully prepared to sit down and settle and live, you know, the quiet life with his sister and his mother and just... Yeah, okay, I'm good. Actually, I don't remember if his... I know his sister was still alive. I don't remember if his mother was still alive. Anyways. Now, given that fact, and the fact that Rodrigo probably knew that, it was very logical to assume, from a setting perspective and from a writing perspective, that Rodrigo had basically ceased to be a villain. N uh, to Ezio, I should say. He ceased to be an antagonist to Ezio, is actually a better way to put that. He was still a villain, obviously. Still not a good man. But he... One of the things I emphasized back in 2, or tried to emphasize, was that Rodrigo did have a brain, and he knew how to use it. And he knew far too well that actually going against Ezio at this point in time was tantamount to suicide, and there was no reason to go through with that. Now, I, f I mention this because the villains of all three games to this point have all been different, and that's a usually a good thing. I, I'm sorry, it is a good thing in this case. I'm not saying it isn't. As much as I don't like the villain of this game, um, I have to I have to say that his the application of a different type of villain was a good thing. In one, we had Mualim, or how the heck you say his name. Forgive me for my in m mispronunciation. Who was extremely um, deceptful, uh, manipulating, a, a very kind of... There, there's a type of manipulation where I am smiling to you and being kind and helpful, and then I stab you in the back. There's a type of, of betrayal in, inherent in that, that, that he was. Rodrigo was still manipulative, was still cunning, was still political, but he was, uh, as weird as this is going to sound, more obvious about it. He was the manipulator. He was the, the chess master. He was not pretending to be anything otherwise. He was just, all right, this is how things are going to go. Cesare is a brute who is also crazy. <laughs> and that's an interesting combination. And so naturally, now that Ezio's about ready to retire, Cesare decides the best possible thing he could do is stick his hand in the hornet's nest and shake it around as hard as he can. So he attacks Ezio's home with an army, and that ultimately was an extremely dumb move on his part. While the move worked, ultimately it, it only served to, sh to cause the end of... of everything, basically. Now, let me... Because everything I mentioned about Ezio starting the Assassin Order as a provincial power, and actually taking uh, taking place on the political scene, actually taking control of cities, actually exerting influence and owning investments and having, uh, you know, land and stuff like that, all of that started because Ezio was pushed into it because Cesare decided to stick his hand on the Hordent's Nest. 
Now, I don't like Cesare. I sh I should, I've already mentioned this. He's there are kind. I've mentioned before that there's a difference between a villain I just don't want to see any more of, and a villain, no matter how horrible they are, that I want to, that I would like to see more of. Uh, I call that the Kefka factor in the latter's case. You know, Kefka was obviously a horrible, just terrifying villain in every sense of the word. But it's still, every time he was on the screen, you're like, yeah, Kafka, you know. Cesare was the former, the kind of villain where every time he's on the screen, I'm just like, oh, go away. Please go away. I can't wait till I kill you. Uh, a good example of this, the former type of villain would actually be Warren Vidic. Uh, I haven't mentioned him at all yet in these videos, because screw that guy. But I hate Warren Vidic and all that he stands for. And as each game has come out, one of the things I keep asking my friend is, can I kill him yet? Because I just hate him. He's irritating. But I'm sorry, I'm getting off topic. No spoilers, remember, in the comments. Um, so Cesare was the kind of villain that I just couldn't stand. That being said, I think they approached him about as well as they could have. He has, unlike Rodrigo and Moalim, Cesare has almost no impact, or, or no presence, actually, is what I want to put that in the story. Obviously he has impact, ignoring the fact that he starts it, and ignoring the fact that he kind of screws everything up and basically loses the Templars' control of Rome. The fact of the matter remains that, other than that initial interaction, you barely interact with him at all, you barely see him at all for a long time. As Ezio is going around, uh, becoming the mentor of the Assassin Order, rebuilding everything, recruiting people, you know, all that fun stuff. And then, finally, towards the end of it, Cesare just kind of rears his head again, and he's like, Rah! and then, you know, loses horribly, and then you go and use use the apple and kill him, and it's awesome. Um... <laughs> I think that was probably the best way they could have probably po possibly approached a villain like that. And one of the reasons why is because, thematically, the greatest point of Brotherhood, in my opinion, is the juxtaposition of the, of the places, okay? The Templars have always been the people who have manipulated the system in order to make it so that their villains, ba their enemies, I'm sorry, that their enemies basically undid themselves on the system, and the Templars themselves never actually had to do much, just a little bit of prodding. In Brotherhood, that has been reversed. Ezio is the one who builds up the order, brings in the investments, takes control of the situation, and manipulates the system so that Cesare basically defeats himself politically and economically and whatnot. And all El all Ezio has to do is do a few little prods here and there. And it's a beautiful, uh, you know, counterpoint. It's a beautiful counterpoint to the way it usually is with the Assassins and the Templars. And then, of course, finally, Cesare escapes and goes off to war. And then you go and kill him, because screw him. Definitely in favor of that. Um... <laughs> Nevertheless, I, I liked that. Even though the whole of the Brotherhood story was not all that revealing about characters. In fact, I'd say Brotherhood is the weakest as far as character development of the story, having not played three. But that being said, one, I, I do like thematic, the, the plot, the overall story of Brotherhood. And I do like the fact that it is it is something that probably should have been a part of two, if I'm honest. At the very least, as an expansion, because this is a crucial point in the history of this world. This is when the assassins rose up and became the equals of the Templars, really. And you have to have that within this kind of a setting. Uh, it, it's too important of an element to leave out. You know, it's the Wolf Three Five Nine of of this setting, except in reverse, if you know what I mean. Is there anything else I wanted to add here? Uh, I'll mention the last. Um, uh, there was one other thing I just wanted to talk about. I was just thinking about it. I'm sorry, I am actually quite tired. <sighs> one of the... okay. <laughs> I have to add one other thing about Brotherhood that I thought was fully awesome. Probably the part of this game that I enjoyed the most. And that is the DLC slash free download, whatever you want to call it, content. I got it through the Ubisoft system because I'm on Steam. Um, I don't know how you get it otherwise. The whole Leonardo missions, where you go through and and you know get to to get to play around in Leonardo's various devices, the helicopter, the water cannon. I don't even know what to call it. You know the tank. Those were awesome. They were moderately relevant to story. Okay. They were interesting from a, a setting standpoint, uh-huh, because, you know, super weapons in that area were relevant. But most importantly of all, they were incredibly fun. <laughs> I had a ball doing those. The whole time I'm like, oh my god, this is awesome. And I actually ended up replaying several of them several times just because I wanted to, just because it was fun. 
that is something that I have to mention here because that is a definite bonus in in, in favor of this game. I, I probably should have mentioned that earlier. One last thing to talk about. Like I said, this is probably going to be a short one. I have no idea what the time is. I never look. But the twist right at the end is one of those things that I've heard people complain about, and uh, for, with decent reason. But it is my opinion that by the time Brotherhood was basically ready to be finished and they were already working on Revelations, it occurred to them that they had to lay the groundwork for what happens in Revelations, okay? Since I'm already in spoiler territory here, I don't mind talking about this in brief. Revelations is the story about Desmond, Altair, and Ezio. Now that may sound strange, but if you actually re if you really pay attention, these three characters haven't really been fully gone into depth in... Well, okay, that's not true. Altair had his section, and Ezio had his section. Desmond hasn't. But ultimately, those three characters and their relation to each other is the is the point of Revelations, right? It's it's the it's the grounding principle of it. In order to have Desmond have this interaction with these people, and of course for us to finally see sixteen, Desmond basically had to go into a coma. I mean, there's other ways you could have done it, but with the setup of the way they had, that was basically the best possible option. One of the things that they did towards the last minute was they decided to do a bit of a switch around with Lucy. And, um, this is a big spoiler, so I'm going to give you one more warning here. But Lucy was always a, uh, a Templar agent. She was very good at deceiving that. She was uh, initially an a assassin agent in the Templars, and then switched sides. So while pretending to be an, assass an, a an, a an agent of the assassins in the Templars, she was actually a Templar agent within the Templars, also for the assassins, if, if you follow me here. And so... Getting rid of her was step one towards the moving the story together. It's pretty clear that they already knew where the Desmond story was going, which I will not talk about here. But they ha in order to get it to that place, they had to get rid of Lucy, and they had to give Desmond something so violently traumatic that it would have to knock him out. And just being controlled by the first ones got him about halfway there, but in, in making him kill Lucy in the same action basically completed both steps of the both steps of the equation that they needed they they got the pl plot a, a pl plot point of point a accomplished by that one swift maneuver and of course the, in so doing they fulfilled the desire that they always like to do which is ending any given assassin's creed game on a big whoa note which is what they've been doing ever since you know the first game um so Overall, while I don't, while I think it probably could have been done a little bit better, I see why they did it that way, and I kind of agree for all intents and purposes. Especially since it gave us revelations for all intents and purposes. It it, it laid the groundwork for us to understand Ezio better, understand Altair better, and to really go into depth finally with Desmond Miles and understand who the heck he is, because we've barely got hints at this point. So. All things considered, I do consider Brotherhood a good game still. I know I'm probably going to get some flack for that, but hey, I, I'm just being honest. And wow, I actually looked at the time. Yeah, this is a lot shorter than I thought. Next one's going to be a lot longer, and a lot more delayed, by the way. I'm not going to be talking about Revelations for a bit, because I'm actually still in the middle of that playthrough. So I will see you guys whenever I get finished with that one. And then we'll finish this up and talk about other games. Oh my god. Anyway.